brought us hit after hit. Now she is facing the music. Speaking out for the first time in court in the battle over her conservatorship with her father. So what's at stake for Britney Spears? How did she get here after skyrocketing to pop star fame? And what is the Free Britney movement saying? This is the battle over Britney, the conservatorship hearing. Here are Diane Macedo and Terry Moran. Hi everyone, I'm Diane Macedo. And I'm Terry Moran. Thanks for joining us. We're looking at a live shot there of the Los Angeles County Superior Courthouse where later this afternoon Britney Spears will virtually address a judge at her own request concerning her conservatorship. It comes 13 years into a court enforced conservatorship that gave her father Jamie control over much of the pop star's life and money. Last year her lawyer argued to have her father removed from her conservatorship. Now Britney will address the court directly for the first time. A new report from the New York Times says court documents allege Britney has been trying to end the conservatorship for years. A grassroots movement of fans is also rallying against the conservatorship, questioning why the court considers Britney unable to care for herself. Many of those fans are planning to be outside that courthouse this afternoon, and we're going to hear from some of them a little later. But first, let's check in with Kaylee Hartung, who's outside the courthouse in LA. Kaylee, what can we expect today? Hey, Diane and Terry, uh, finally a chance to hear from the pop princess herself. She stayed largely silent throughout this 13 year conservatorship about how she feels about losing control of her life and her finances. But keep in mind, this hearing was requested by her lawyer a year ago when they petitioned the judge to have her father removed from her conservatorship. Now, it's unclear what specific issues she'll bring up today or whether or not she'll ask for an end to be put to this conservatorship altogether. You mentioned that new reporting from the New York Times that says Britney's been working behind the scenes for years to get out of this controlled situation that she's in. So here we are. Now, none of this means, though, that we'll actually get to see Britney today. This is going to be a virtual appearance by her in front of a judge. The judge is not allowing us to see video of Britney's appearance. We'll only be able to listen in. And they're not allowing any of this, any of the proceedings to be recorded. So we'll be standing by to let you know what happens. As for the free Britney movement, those very loyal fans of hers that you've seen so often come out in force to support her. We haven't seen any sign of them yet, but we're still about four hours away from this court hearing getting started. And you can bet that the scene here will pick up in the coming hours. Yes. Guys, we have heard so much about this moment, and yet this will be the first time we actually hear from Britney herself. Kaylee Hartung, thank you. We're going to check back in with you in just a moment. And it is an important legal and personal autonomy issue for Britney Spears. She's been under a conservatorship for more than a decade now with her financial and even personal decisions being made for her. In the new report in the New York Times that you've heard about, uh, it says that court documents show Britney's previously alleged that conservators, quote, restricted everything from who she dated to the color of her kitchen cabinets. Some of her fans and friends say the star should be free, but today is the first time we're going to be hearing from from Britney herself on what she wants. Here's Kira Phillips. That unmistakable sound that can only be Britney Spears. For the first time in nearly 13 years, Britney will address the court directly telling the judge what she thinks of the conservatorship she's been under. Britney's conservatorship was initially orchestrated by her father, Jamie, allowing her father to make life decisions for her, while also controlling what is now her estimated $60 million estate. Britney's court-appointed lawyer says his client has called the conservatorship voluntary, but is seeking substantial changes, including her father's removal as co-conservator of her finances. Ingham says Britney's afraid of her father and will not perform again if her dad is in charge of her career. Our Amy Robach asked Jamie Spears' lawyer about the statement. Why would that happen? Why would that statement be made? Throughout 2020, Brittany and her father had many conversations. And in fact, early on in the pandemic, they spent two weeks with other family members hunkered down in Louisiana. Brittany and Jamie went on long drives together. They played and worked in the family garden. 
Raise it. And every night, Jamie cooked Southern comfort food that the family ate and enjoyed together. And in that time, Brittany never expressed those words to her father. She's never asked him to step aside. While he retains control of her finances, Jamie did step down as personal conservator in 2019, citing health reasons. The New York Times out with a new report after obtaining confidential court records from 2016, revealing Brittany was more opposed to the conservatorship than previously known and felt forced to perform. The conservatorship restricting who she dated, even the color of her kitchen cabinets. So far, Brittany has not asked the court to end her conservatorship. I'm totally fine. I'm extremely happy. Now the question is, will she also tell that to the court? Kira Phillips, ABC News, Washington. And our thanks to Kira Phillips for that report. And joining us now to help us understand and break this all down is ABC News legal contributor Chana Lloyd, family law attorney David Glass, as well as ABC News contributor Chris Connolly, and New York Times senior story editor and co-creator of that Framing Britney uh, film documentary that's just so good. Liz Day is with us as well. Welcome all. Uh, and David, I, I want to begin with you because a lot of people haven't heard what a conservatorship is. That's a legal term. And who is normally placed under one? So how would you explain that? A conservatorship is a legal proceeding where someone comes to the court, a family member or friend, and says, uh, my father or mother or aunt or uncle uh, is incapacitated. They have a... Uh, a problem with their thinking, they have a problem with their memory, or perhaps they have a problem with their emotional functioning, and they simply can't care for themselves or care for their money, their estate. Uh, so they come to the court asking to be appointed to handle all those decisions for the incapacitated person. And how unusual is it for someone Brittany's age and apparent capacities to be under a conservatorship like this? It's extremely unusual. Uh, conservatorships, by and large, are for elderly people suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's disease or an advanced psychological disorder. Uh, to see a young person conserved is relatively rare. And then to see a young person conserved for 13 years is extremely rare. When you do see a young person enter into a conservatorship, typically they, they go for treatment, uh, they get prescribed medication, uh, their emotions and their logic balances out and they're able to come out of the conservatorship relatively quickly and that's just not the case uh, in this uh, in this story now Shauna for years some fans have been pointing to Britney's continued ability to work and perform all this time as evidence that she can take care of herself and doesn't need to be in this conservatorship how strong is that as a legal argument it's not strong enough for a legal argument because although she may be functioning in those day-to-day -day tasks, it doesn't mean that she's able to function at a higher capacity in order to handle managing her finances. That's a different standard. And so you're going to be looking at a lot of medical experts talking about a mental health evaluation to see if she's able to function at a higher capacity to manage her finances. And on the flip side, Jamie Spears and his lawyer have said that he would love for her to not need this conservative but that he's doing this in her best interest. And his attorney has also pointed out that Britney's finances have grown exponentially since that conservatorship was instated. So how much will that factor into this decision? That's definitely a factor for the court. The court wants to make sure that whoever is appointed at the, as the head of the conservatorship is managing the resources and making sure that they would do what they should do and become beneficial to the conservatee. So they want to see a financial situation that is going to be better than it was, because that's the purpose of the conservatorship, is to make sure that none of the financial resources are being squandered. And Liz, you're a co-creator of the documentary Framing Britney, which was such a deep dive and so humane a look at, at this remarkable story. Just yesterday, you and other reporters from the New York Times reported that court documents show that Britney's previously alleged that conservators, quote, restricted everything from who she dated to the color of the kitchen cabinets, as we've been reporting, and, and that she's been pushing to end this conservatorship for years. So we should note that ABC News has reached out to Jamie Spears about that new report. We've not heard back. What does your new reporting tell us ahead of Britney's hearing today? How significant is it? 
So uh, our new reporting, uh, as you know, reveals that, you know, for years earlier than anyone knew, Brittany has been pushing to end the conservatorship and even raising complaints about her father's fitness in his role as conservator. And this was really surprising because defenders of the conservatorship have maintained that not only is this in Brittany's best interest, but that she could file to end it at any time if she so wanted to, basically implying that she wanted to be in this conservatorship. Hmm. So what surprised you most about what you read in those court documents, given the, the story up till now, what people have been hearing in public? A few things surprised me most. First off was how troubled Brittany and Jamie's relationship has been from the very start. Jamie was not around very much when she was growing up and he had serious alcohol issues. And to see that Brittany was raising in court back in 2014, uh, his drinking and his fitness to be her conservator was, was really shocking. The other thing that was very surprising was um, that Brittany told a court investigator in 2016 that she was sick of being taken taken advantage of and that everyone around her depended on her for their income. You often hear from critics of the conservatorship that, you know, the system profits off of Britney, but to hear it directly from her mouth, according to this report, was very surprising. Now, Chris, you've covered Britney Spears for years now. You worked at MTV when her career took off, and you covered her in 2008 when she was first placed under this conservatorship after apparently suffering a mental health crisis. So what has stood out to you watching her life and career through the years and also her relationship with her father? You know, there's a wonderful line in Framing Britney Spears, the documentary that says, we don't know what we don't know. And now, thanks to the reporting of the New York Times, it seems like we are knowing a lot of the things that we didn't know previously. One of the things that's striking about Jamie Spears' involvement is when you think of pop music and fathers, you think of, in some cases, people who are really controlling from an early stage in a pop star's career. Think of Joe Jackson, the way he really oversaw the creation of the Jackson 5. Matthew Knowles, Britney, uh, Matthew Knowles, who was was Beyonce's father, had the vision for Destiny's Child when Beyonce was just 11, Joe Simpson with Ashley and uh, Jessica Simpson, or even when the NFL wanted to talk to Whitney Houston about the way she was going to do the national anthem, they called John Houston. None of these situations applies to Jamie Spears. He was not involved in the early stages of her career in any way. When Britney and Lynn, her mother, collaborated on a book in 2000 called Heart to Heart, it was a 144-page book. Jamie Spears was mentioned once. So this is a very unusual turn of events that he would come into her life in a professional way so late in the game and perhaps begins to help us understand why there's such mistrust here. And, and Chris, I wonder, you talk about the history of uh, fathers, parents in the, in the lives and careers of child stars, young stars like this, uh, and, and he wasn't involved in this. So what does that tell you about her career and about, uh, you know, why she's in this situation? Well, I mean, she, you know, she showed up at, at uh, in the early 90s, in the late 90s, like, you know, like she'd stepped off a meteorite. She was a star right from the drop, and it was something that she'd worked on for a long time. But this had been something that had been important to her and her mother. It was her mother who, when Britney was nine years old, drove her all the way to Atlanta for that open call audition for the new Mickey Mouse Club. It was her mother who went to New York with her when she worked as an understudy to a play. So this was very much not Jamie Spears' side of the aisle when it came to Britney's career. And so the conflicts that they're experiencing now do not like, you know, do not stem from his being involved in her career at an early age. Hmm. And, and David, if I could come back to you uh, on this, w the court will hear from Britney Spears today. So what kind of impact could her statement have in her conservatorship and her future in general? Well, the court is looking to hear from Brittany exactly what she wants at this moment. What's a little bit unusual is that typically before a conservatee addresses the court, there are pleadings on file explaining what that person wants the court to do. Here we simply don't have that. Her uh, appointed attorney, Samuel Ingham, came relatively out of nowhere at the last hearing and said she'd like to address the court and she'd like to do it on an expedited basis. So while what she says will be important to the court, I doubt the court can make any 
important decisions today because there simply aren't the pleadings that uh, will tell the court what Brittany wants to do. It's unlikely that she has the medical records or neuropsychological testing that could prove that she has regained her capacity. Um, and so we're just going to have to wait and see what Brittany has to say to the court. And, and Shauna, while we talk a lot about Jamie Spears, he's not the only person involved in this conspiratorship. When it comes to Britney's finances, there's also a financial company that is part of this conservatorship and partially helps manage her finances. So could this decision also impact that third party in the conservatorship? Absolutely. The third party is appointed because they typically are going to be the financial advisors. They're usually a third party independent and they have an extensive wealth of information about finances to assist him. This can impact them because if the conservatorship was dissolved, then none of them would be needed or they may seek to replace him with someone that works for that financial company because you can always change who is heading the conservatorship as well. And, and David, if I could just come back to you on something that people might be confused about. If Britney Spears comes into court and tells the judge, I, I don't want this conservatorship or I'm, I'm happy with the conservatorship, I'm not happy with the current conservator, my dad, why shouldn't that go? She's a, an adult. Why, why shouldn't that determine the course of events? Uh, the basic problem here is that she's under a conservatorship because at some point in the past and periodically since then, the court has determined that she lacks either the logical abilities or memory abilities or emotional modulation abilities to make decisions for herself. So until she and her legal team can prove that she has capacity, she has the ability to make decisions for herself, for her own person, uh, regarding her own assets and her income, what she has to say doesn't have those underpinnings. Um, so, uh, while, again, while it's important and the court wants to hear from her, uh, until they have all those pieces of information that will show that she has regained her capacity, what she has to say is not going to rule today. Liz, what are some key points you'll be listening for today? Well, uh, no one really knows what Brittany is going to say. It's very rare that she speaks to the court, um, and it's never been done publicly for all of us to be able to hear. Um, so, you know, in essence, I'm just interested to hear what it is that she wants. Find out some of that, I hope. Liz Day, Shauna Lloyd, David Glass, and Chris Connolly, thanks very much for helping us understand this important day in many ways. So, at from a tiny Louisiana town, shot to pop superstardom with the release of her first hit, Baby One More Time. When we come back, a look at Britney Spears' road to becoming the princess of pop. Stay with us. Guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, We taught all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. It's so weird sometimes when I think I'm more comfortable on stage than I am in my own room. When I get on stage, it's kind of like your chance to let go and be something that you're not, maybe. But it's your time to dream. And then I look back and I'm like, oh, okay, I just did that, you know. 
Welcome back. That was Britney Spears talking to Diane Sawyer back in 2003, the same year Britney released her fourth chart-topping album in the zone and won a Grammy for her hit song, Toxic. Spears, a small town girl from a Louisiana town of just 2,000 people, is one of the most successful pop stars of all time. She sold nearly 100 million records worldwide, and her first hit, Baby One More Time, has gone platinum 14 times. So how did she become the princess of pop? Kaylee Hartung has her story. When you think 90s, you think fashion. Dial up internet. You've got mail. And pop music. Headlined by the princess of pop. Britney Spears. Britney Spears. Britney Spears. Britney Spears. Giving us two of the best selling albums of all time Baby One More Time. And Oops, I Did It Again. But before she became pop royalty, Spears was just a small town Southern girl. Britney! At 11 years old, she landed a spot on Disney's Mickey Mouse Club. At 15, Spears signed her first record deal with Jive Records, the same label behind up and coming boy bands Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. And it was that record deal that brought us Britney's breakout album and an unforgettable music video. What were the conversations like about transforming Britney from this small town Louisiana girl mm -hmm. into someone with broader national appeal? Likeability, empathy, maintaining the core values of being a young girl and being a member of American society and not being some mythical, fantastical superhero type. Like for instance, in the Baby One More Time video, being able to wear a Catholic school girl outfit, but tie the shirt around your waist and put little pink pom-poms in your hair and wear makeup in school. These are things that only a young adult dreams of doing. They can't really do that in real life. So. It's a bit of a fantasy, but it's a grounded fantasy that she's still a member of their peer group. So it was about building the, the friend up and getting access to things that they couldn't normally have. The album shot to the top of the charts, sold more than 10 million copies in the U.S., and made Spears a household name. You get this kind of audience reaction everywhere? Most of the time. These are really good, though, I have to say. <laughs> Some of them are more boisterous? Um, sometimes. Spears was named the first lady of MTV's Total Request Live. For first lady, oh, she's good. Britney Spears, everybody. Bringing thousands of Britney fans to Times Square during her first ever performance. In 2000, her second album, Oops, I Did It Again, sold 1.3 million copies in the first week, setting a record for sales by a solo artist. When you think back to meeting Britney at just 15 years old, did you ever imagine her career could have the arc that it did? I absolutely did not think that at all. I mean, you know, Britney was not the first female teen pop artist. There were others before her um, and alongside her, but she was unique in that she had a certain talent set that was absolutely different than any of those girls. Those unique talents were recognized by other pop icons like Madonna. I saw something the other day. Madonna was wearing a Britney Spears t-shirt. What cool. was that about? <laughs> I don't know, man. Well, my managers, they called me and they told me. I was like, what? It's just really weird because since I was like a little girl and I was eight years old, I've always listened to her. And then to open up a magazine and see Madonna wearing a Britney Spears t-shirt, I was like, this is cool. And year after year, Spears stole the stage at MTV's Video Music Awards. One of her most iconic of those performances was in 2001, singing her hit, I'm a Slave for You, with a snake around her neck. Everyone now, they look back and they're like, what happened to your sweet image that you used to be? And I'm like, then when I came out, you thought I was too provocative. It's like you can never win. No matter what you do, at the end of the day, you can't please everybody, you know? I'm not here to please. When her conservatorship was created in 2008, Spears kept making music and touring, and her fans stuck by her, some even creating the Free Britney movement.
there in her corner as they are today, because all of those kids that were six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old in 1998 are now adults. And so they're part of the whole free Britney movement, which is really marvelous because what it says about Britney is that she made these people feel so welcomed into her life that now they want to defend her ability to have her own life. In 2013, she announced her two-year residency in Las Vegas on Good Morning America. And in 2019, a second Las Vegas residency. But shortly after, Spears announced she was taking an indefinite work hiatus, canceling that residency, citing her father Jamie's health concerns. Now it's been years since we've seen her on a stage. I saw her perform in Vegas and absolutely had the reaction of, Britney still got it, and then she was gone. But do you foresee a Britney comeback? Will we see her on stage again? 100%. 100% will you see her back on stage again. So in the 13 years that Britney's been under this conservatorship, tally it up. She's worked the stage for two Vegas residencies. She was a judge on The X Factor. She created a clothing line, a perfume line. And that's the real irony here. After a judge ruled that she was unfit to make her own decisions and she was incapable of managing her own money, she continued to bring in millions of dollars. And Diane both and sides, both sides, no doubt, are going to use that in court today. Uh, but Kaylee, I want to ask you for a little personal perspective here because you're also from Louisiana, just like Britney Spears. So how big of a deal is her rise to fame, especially for those who also grew up in small towns? Diane, right out of the gate, at Britney at 15 years old, I remember so vividly the first time I saw that Hit Me Baby One More Time video because I already knew who she was. And there she was, the small town Louisiana girl making it big on MTV. And none of us could have imagined the global pop star that she would become. But when you think about that video, she was so relatable in those early days. You saw her there in that Catholic school girl's uniform, walking the halls of a high school in the school gym. She looked like she could be one of your classmates. And then her career blew up to a level, again, that none of us could have ever imagined. It's just been an incredible story to watch, and you know, this is as big as a story in pop culture gets, and we will be here to let you know what happens inside this courthouse today. Diane. Right. Kaylee Hartung for us in L.A. outside the courthouse. Kaylee, thank you. And for more on Britney's stories, let's bring in ABC News contributor Chris Connolly, senior writer at Rolling Stone, Britney Spanos, and Sirius XM radio host and ABC News contributor Mike Muse, who's actually here on set with me, our first on-set guest, I might add. Yes. Mike, very happy to have you here. You. Uh, but Chris, I'm actually going to start with, with you. As I mentioned before, you worked at MTV when Britney Spears became a household name. I know you covered her in depth for years. Is there something that sticks out to you that you feel like the general public either doesn't know about Britney or maybe forgets? about Britney when it comes to her story in the larger context here. Well, it's great to hear how uh, people talk in that piece just now about how relatable she was, because that was really a big part of her appeal from the beginning. I think you could say she was the undiva. You know, pop stars, male and female, we're used to hearing a lot of demands and they're being somewhat imperious, and that was not at all what Britney Spears was like in those early days. Remember all those contract, all that stuff about like the contract writers people had and the demands they had to be backstage? Yeah, we had Britney's to put all orange M&Ms for Mike Muse today yeah. on the set. <laughs> exactly. The only thing Britney wanted was a was a telephone, which tells you how long ago that was. And if somebody called the phone, the promoter had to pay five thousand dollars. So she was really low maintenance and and accessible that way. And she came at a crucial time in MTV's history and in pop music history. Remember, in 1998, three of the biggest music stars of the 90s had died in the 90s by gunfire. You had Notorious B.I.G., Kurt Cobain, and Tupac Shakur. So it was time for something that struck a different note. And she came on just with energy and vitality and youth, and she really changed the game, as you saw and rocketed uh, to stardom. It seems like one day there, were, there, there was no Britney and then Britney was everywhere. So Britney Spanos, if I could ask you, according to Billboard, so six of her albums I just looked uh, have hit number one on the Billboard 200 chart and in the U.S. alone, she sold more than 70 million albums, singles and digital songs, according to Nielsen Music. So how significant is it that this major pop star, this major figure in American culture is in the spotlight like this for this legal battle, do you think? 
I mean, the thing with Britney Spears is that she became an icon almost immediately. That's pretty unprecedented, especially at that time where there was a big sort of boom of these teenage pop stars. Britney was the blueprint for everyone who came after her. And she just immediately became the zeitgeist. She was the, and still is the pop star. She's the princess of pop and there's no taking that away from her. But the amount of significant influence she's had over pop music is so extraordinary in a way that we haven't seen so much in the last two decades where almost every single major pop act, you can draw a, a direct line to Britney Spears. You know, you look at Taylor Swift, Miley Cyrus, you look at, um, you know, just anyone, like Olivia Rodrigo, you look at Billie Eilish, like you can all, there is that line to Britney Spears there. So it is it is very tragic and, you know, important to be looking at this case because for so many young stars, for teenage stars especially, the way that Britney Spears has entered the world and the way that the world has treated Britney Spears is an important tale to study and to learn from and to hopefully not see replicated in the future. And it's unfortunate that we've had to continue to see her fight to be respected and be treated like a human being. And Chris, in 2008, Britney was placed under this conservatorship following two hospitalizations and con concerns surrounding her mental health and, and substance issues. So take us back to 2008. What do we know about what was going on with Britney during that time? The one thing that everybody loves about young stars is that they are compliant. They will do what you want them to do. Oh, she's willing to do that. And Britney worked harder than anyone else, so much so that someone like Melissa Joan Hart, who appeared with Britney in that crazy video, who had been in two TV shows on her own, said, Britney, you're working too hard. Um, so there comes a time in every young star's life when they will do what people ask them to do, and then a moment when they will not. And that's what happened when Britney hit 25. And what happened, unfortunately, afterwards it was a downward spiral that was, in fact, part of the new technologies that were happening and this kind of boom in the paparazzo world. You had TMZ out there that referred to Britney. I think, I think Harvey at TMZ once said that, like, Britney for that site was like crack for an addict. You had this huge boom in the paparazzi game where the, the, uh, the magazines were paying huge prices, where if you got one shot of Britney in a particular way, you could make over $100,000. At the height of her most, you know, of her greatest turmoil, when she would leave her house, 30 cars would follow her to Starbucks or to the gas station. It was an insane situation. And that's what eventually resulted in her uh, getting the conservatorship. Now, last week, Brittany took questions from her fans on Instagram, and she was asked whether she'll perform again. I want to take a look at her answer. Am I ready to take the stage again? Am I going to take the stage again? Will I ever take the stage again? I have no idea. I'm having fun right now. I'm a transition in my life, and I'm enjoying myself. So that's it. Mike, what do you make of this answer? Because fans on Instagram are dissecting every single word that she says, but particularly the part where she's saying she's in a transition period. Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't think we know the answer to that. I think whatever Britney Spears chooses to do is her right. She's given so much to the public. She's giving so much of herself to us for us to be entertained. Even Chris outlined the demands at that cost of her personally and the vulnerability of being exposed. So whatever she chooses to do going forward, I think it's up to her. But I don't know if the stage is still in her, so it'll be curious to figure out. It's a lot that has been on her. I definitely think music is in her, but I don't know if we will see the snakes uh, wrapped around her neck again, but we never know. And Mike, you know, you, you, pop music, of course, is a, is a young person's uh, business mostly. Uh, she had such a huge impact on so many people, on a, generations of people. Uh, here she is at this different point in her life. What do you think the broader impact of today's hearing, however it goes, will be with Britney back in the spotlight on the broader culture? I think for the broader culture, we're all going to have to examine the role that we have all played in Britney Spears' rise and some would say falter in her transition to try and get back up to owning her identity again. I think the media has a role to play in terms of how we engage with celebrities, in particular young girls, um, as they're coming of age and finding themselves. I think this is also to take note for those who are musicians and artists and actors in the space in terms of how to create guardrails. Like, we're all in this space now where we're talking about 
self-care, mental health awareness. I think it's important for those individuals to take that too as well. But seeing Brittany going to court uh, to testify to gain her own autonomy, I think it rocks not just those of us in the media, those who are just fans of Britney Spears, but on a human interest level as a full-grown adult to watch another adult essentially have to get permission from her father on how much money she can get per week after all the work that she has done. I think from a human interest perspective, I understand the legal perspective, but from the human interest perspective, I think that resonates well with a lot of people. And some people would say that's just not fair, it seems. All right, Mike Muse, Chris Connolly, Brittany Spanos, great to have you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And some Spears and some of Spears' biggest fans have rallied behind the pop star, questioning why the court continues to consider her unable to care for herself. When we come back, we'll speak with the two women who helped create the viral hashtag Free Britney and hear what the Free Britney movement is saying now. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I believe that Free Britney is a human rights issue, a civil rights issue, a women's rights issue, a disability rights issue, and so much more. This issue of conservatorship abuse affects thousands of people across the nation and beyond, and we must advocate to affect change in the probate courts. Britney Spears never qualified to be in this probate conservatorship, so I am very passionate about fighting to not only free Britney, but to restore rights to other conservatees who have also been wronged by this abusive system. Brittany should be able to live life on her own terms. I started advocating because not enough people were taking the issue of conservatorship abuse seriously, and I really wanted to use my voice to make a difference. I'm fighting for Brittany's freedom because Brittany has worked consistently throughout this entire conservatorship. When does she get the chance to prove herself? Going through hardships in your mid-20s should not result in a life sentence under a conservatorship. Welcome back. Those were some of Britney Spears' biggest fans rallying behind the so-called Free Britney movement. Many of them are working professionals who dedicate their spare time to questioning why the court considers Britney Spears unable to care for herself. And we should note that one of those activists you heard from there, Leanne Simmons, works for our parent company, Disney. Now, the hashtag Free Britney was actually started by two women who launched the Britney's Graham podcast, which examines and analyzes Britney Spears' social media posts. And the hosts of Britney's Graham, Tess Barker and Babs Gray, are actually here with us with a little bit more on this. Hi, ladies. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, Babs, I want to start with you. I know you have this new podcast dropping next month, Toxic, the Britney Spears story, and it's taking a deep dive into the conservatorship and sort of the larger issue of the legal system that Britney Spears is now in. So while you were doing all this research, what surprised you most about this conservatorship? I think what surprised us most is just um, that it wasn't right from the beginning. You know, we've analyzed the weekend that she got conserved uh, every which way we can. And there were many, many things that happened that were unjust. And, you know, we don't feel like she was even put into it in a cor for correct reasons or in the correct way. So from the very beginning, we think it was an unjust situation. And Tess, uh, Brittany's dad and his lawyer have argued that uh, Jamie would love to see Brittany not need a conservatorship, but act his lawyers pointed out that Brittany's finances have grown exponentially under the conservatorship. She's much wealthier now than she was. What do you say to all of that? Why is she still in this? 
Well, I think for starters, the idea that the conservatorship is somehow helping Brittany avoid some kind of uh, financial wrongdoing is is questionable at best because this conservatorship is very expensive for Brittany. You know, one of Jamie's lawyers, Vivian Thoreen, makes over $1,000 an hour. Um, and so these are very expensive proceedings that are going on. Every time somebody, every time we have a 15 minute hearing in court, it comes at the, at the expense of Brittany. So she's paying not only for her own attorney, who she didn't choose, who bills $10,000 a week, but Jamie's entire expensive fleet of lawyers. So, and all of that's happening without her consenting to that money being spent. So I think it's difficult to say that the conservatorship is helping her from, from being taken advantage of financially when in fact large swaths of her money are being spent without her consent. Uh, Babs, a lot has been said about what Brittany wants or doesn't want to hear, but this is the first time we're going to hear from her directly addressing the court. What do you hope to see happen today and what are you listening for as that testimony happens? I hope that Brittany can speak freely about how she feels about what she wants and I hope that it will make something happen. I mean, we've just seen with the New York Times piece that she's spoken to the court many times about how she feels about the situation. I mean, she's told the court that she's you know, through her lawyer, that she's afraid of her father. And so the fact that that hasn't changed anything is really disturbing to us. So. We're hoping that not only is she able to speak freely about what she wants, but that there's able to be action from those words. All right. Tess Barker and Babs Gray, hosts of Britney's Graham podcast. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And that does it for us today. Our coverage will continue later this afternoon once Britney Spears has addressed the court around 430 Eastern time. Uh, until then, keep watching. I'm Diane Macedo. Have a great day.